Dust Bowl elbows. We have those? Oh, yeah. But Jurgen's Original Cherry Almond Lotion keeps away the elbow drought. Smell it. I love it. Happening now. I'm Dylan Collier. More problems for ERCOT. Tight grid conditions in the state of Texas for the second straight day. What that means and how do we fix it? Coming up. President Biden setting a target date to end America's longest war when he says all U.S. troops will be out of Afghanistan. Greg Brockhouse once again looking for a shot at the mayor's office. You'll hear his ideas during tonight's candidate forum. But first, who is the candidate he says he is this time around? We have a little bit of activity on the radar screen. Of course, we'll take a close look at that, talk about rain chances for the rest of the week, and a very noticeable cold front on the way. I'll see you in a few minutes. And if you're having trouble signing up for a COVID-19 vaccine, the city of San Antonio is promising help. The new wait list announced today and how you can sign up. The News at 5 starts right now. First at five, it happened again, but this time no one lost power. ERCOT, the operator of the state's electric grid, says it came to the brink of entering emergency conditions yesterday when it had trouble meeting energy demand. That alert causing concern across Texas as it still reels from February's dangerous and deadly power outages, which in some places, including San Antonio, lasted for several days. As our Dylan Collier reports, the timing of the most recent alarm is most troubling since it took place during a mild spring day. Power grid stability again jumped to the forefront of the minds of Texans after the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, or ERCOT, asked residents to conserve energy for around four hours Tuesday evening, the latest occasion in which demand for power nearly eclipsed supply. ERCOT officials blaming the scenario on a quarter of its generating capacity being offline for maintenance, both routine and to fix issues caused by mid-February's winter blast. We anticipated cooler weather today than what we're seeing, and so the loads are a little bit higher. The outages are maintenance outages. But what happens this summer when statewide energy demand will routinely be double what it was yesterday? ERCOT officials said today it was again experiencing tight grid conditions but did not expect it to elevate to a conservation alert. And what about the infrastructure issues exposed by the most recent extreme weather event? According to Jesse Jenkins, an assistant professor of engineering at Princeton University, these are not new problems. You, know, you read the reports from 1989, you read reports from 2011 or that followed the 2011 crisis and they read like they could be written today. So it's not like the insights and the warnings weren't there. A bill before the Texas legislature that would dramatically reform the state's energy industry, including making weatherization of power infrastructure mandatory, was unanimously passed by the Senate late last month. It now sits in committee on the House side. Even more important, I think, than you know, finding out who's to blame is figuring out how we're going to fix it and make sure this doesn't happen again. ERCON officials yesterday said these type of energy conservation alerts could happen for the next three to four weeks. One energy expert told me today it's unlikely, though, that we will see rolling outages like we did in February. And even if we did, they would be brief because we are not in a severe weather situation. Reporting live, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Dylan. A 39 year old man has been arrested after he reportedly shot a North Texas police officer during a traffic stop this morning. It happened in Burleson. That's just south of Fort Worth. The suspect Jerry Don Elders arrested in Gainesville about an hour drive north of where the shooting took place. The officer John Peter Smith taken to the hospital. We have no update on his condition at this hour. New at five, a two alarm fire forcing dozens of residents at a north side apartment complex out of their homes this morning. It happened at the Villas Rodriguez apartments on Nacogdoches Road and Salado Parkway. Right now, the cause is unknown. Firefighters say no one was hurt, but about 60 to 100 people were forced to leave their homes. The Red Cross is helping them to find some temporary places to stay total of 10 pets were rescued. A three year old and a grandparent. OK, after they escaped a fire this afternoon, it happened in the 13,800 block of Cassiano Road in Elmendorf. That's in southeast Bear County. Fire officials say that fire sparked next to the home. It caused about eight thousand to ten thousand dollars in damage. That cause is still being determined. Arguments continue in the murder trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, who is charged in the death of George Floyd. Today, defense attorneys calling medical experts to the stand in an effort to prove their theory that drugs and heart issues led to Floyd's death. ABC's Rena Roy has more. 
For the first time, jurors hearing from a medical expert called by Derek Chauvin's defense team as they try to prove George Floyd died from drug and heart issues. Forensic pathologist David Fowler testifying Floyd's neck had no evidence of injury from Chauvin's knee and that he had a sudden heart incident while officers restrained him. How did the heart and, heart and drugs contribute to the cause of death? They were significant or other contrib they, they contributed to um, Mr. Floyd having um, a sudden cardiac arrest, in my opinion. He also suggested carbon monoxide from the squad car's exhaust pipe where Floyd was pinned down may have contributed to his death. It's the prosecution then pressing yeah. Fowler. Uh, are you able to tell this jury <clears throat> whether or not Mr. Floyd, at the time that he was being subdued on May 25th, was being exposed to carbon monoxide above the limit or level that was set by the EPA of nine parts per million. No, no testing was done. The defense began presenting their case on Tuesday, zeroing in on that drug use, calling on Shawanda Hill, who was in Floyd's car when the incident began, saying he fell asleep in the parked vehicle before officers arrived. I said, Floyd, the, the police is here. It's about the $20 bill wasn't real. I kept saying, baby, get up. They're also attempting to convince the jury Chauvin's actions were justified. Use of force expert Barry Broad saying Chauvin's knee on Floyd's neck was appropriate. That's a control technique. Without It, it doesn't hurt. He then backtracked when cross-examined by prosecutors. Shown in this picture, that could be a use of force. Once the defense wraps up their case, both sides will present closing arguments and the jury could get the case sometime next week. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Meantime, the Minnesota police officer who shot and killed Dante Wright is being charged with second degree manslaughter. Wright killed on Sunday during a traffic stop in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. The officer Kim Potter, who resigned on rather resigned yesterday, was arrested this morning. Potter, a 26 year veteran of the force and training officer, says she mistook her gun for a taser. There's a reason why tasers are a different size, uh, why the handle is different. And that's why you are trained to make sure that you are reaching for the right weapon. Today, the mayor of Brooklyn Center said he had not yet accepted Potter's resignation and firing her is still an option pending the outcome of the investigation. A major announcement today affecting the United States military. President Joe Biden setting a target date when all troops will be pulled out of Afghanistan. President Biden saying it's time to end America's longest war, and he plans on withdrawing all military presence later on this year. Our Jonathan Goto joins us now with details on the withdrawal. That's right. The war in Afghanistan is the longest war in U.S. history. President Biden bringing an end to the 20-year intervention in Afghanistan by a very significant date, the 20th anniversary of the attacks on 9-11. President Biden speaking from the treaty room at the White House, the same place President George W. Bush made his announcement of military strikes in Afghanistan nearly decades ago. Biden says U.S. military presence in Afghanistan should be focused on ensuring the country wasn't being used as a base for more terrorists would attack the U.S. He says that objective has been accomplished. We cannot continue the cycle of extending or expanding our military presence in Afghanistan, hoping to create ideal conditions for the withdrawal and expecting a different result. Biden says justice was delivered to bin Laden over a decade ago during the Obama administration and says the reasons to continue in that area of operation has become increasingly unclear. Biden is now the fourth U.S. president to preside over troops in Afghanistan and says he will not pass this war on over to a fifth president. Reporting, Jonathan Cotto, Steve Ursula. Thank you, Jonathan. Let's take a look at the daily COVID-19 numbers in Bear County. Metro Health reporting 252 new cases and six more deaths in the county. 198 people are hospitalized, 70 are in the ICU, and 32 are on ventilators. 621,769 people have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. 392,097 people are now fully vaccinated. And this just into the case at 12 newsroom, a CDC advisory panel has voted to keep the Johnson & Johnson vaccine on pause for at least a week. 
Meantime, the city and Healthcare Access San Antonio have launched their COVID-19 vaccine wait list or registry to register people for other available options. You can sign up now either online or by calling 311 and selecting option eight. The registry only available to people who live in Texas, priority given to those 65 years and older. The city says it could take several weeks for your appointment to be scheduled as more vaccines become available. And we have a link to sign up right now on KSAT.com. Another pop-up clinic is taking place tomorrow, but this time it's to keep those working in the service industry safe. The organization HERD that is dedicated to the well-being of workers in the food and beverage industry now partnering up with a pharmacist to get vaccinations to people who need them. A lot of them don't have health insurance um, or access to health insurance or limited um, access to, uh, to health care. Um, and so providing them with uh, something um, that will help them and allow them to continue to do their job and not get sick um, is, uh, is vital. Reservations are full for this event. Coming up at 6, you can hear from a local chef about what this clinic means to him. Former City Councilman Greg Brockhaus once again looking to win the mayor's office just two years after forcing Ron Nuremberg into a close runoff. We're going to hear straight from Brockhouse coming up tonight at 6 during a preview of our Barifax KSAT San Antonio Report Mayoral Forum. But first, Garrett Berger with a sneak peek of what the mayoral challenger says is different this time around. A little more than 2% of the vote kept Greg Brockhaus out of the mayor's office in 2019, following his first term as a city council member. I don't regret coming out in 2019. I felt like the city was on the wrong track then and there was an opportunity. In 2021, he senses opportunity again. Though he hasn't been in the public eye as a council member, Brockhaus has been spending time between his work as a mortgage lender and owning a janitorial company to put out the Brockhaus a political podcast he puts on Facebook, which he started shortly after the last mayoral race in an effort to stay visible. People get elected after they lose. They get elected because they don't give up and they keep coming back. They don't quit. Not even after what he calls a dogfight of an election in 2019. Domestic violence allegations dragged on Brockhouse in that campaign, though he and his wife later talked about them in detail with Steve Spreester. He says he's not worried about it being an issue this time and that he's ready to answer whatever questions people have. They have to know that our family is not a family of domestic violence. It's not those things are completely false. This year, Brockhouse says he's concentrating on telling people who he is and who he wants to be. And he's putting out extensive plans on his campaign website. So the biggest thing I'm coming back with is an attitude of family and faith and putting it out there and just talking about the future. And what he says will be his final attempt at the mayor's office. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But we're blessed to be back and thankful for the opportunity. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. We started our day at 70 degrees, topped out at 85, but actually we just reached 86 degrees just moments ago. So that will be our new high temperature for the day, 86. Of course, we need some rainfall. We had a few showers along the coastal plain. We'll take a closer look at those in a moment. Temperatures mostly in the 80s. We're not looking at 90s out there because of the clouds that we've had throughout the day today. A decent amount of cloud cover again, but unfortunately not a lot of rain to show for them. Still some isolated chances through the evening and into the night. We're going to talk about rain chances over the next couple of days. I've got lake levels and a stronger cold front that you're going to notice on the way coming right up. Are your wipes clogging your pipes? Even the ones that claim to be flushable might not be so good. A bidet might not be something you've given much thought to before, but up next, we're going to tell you how they work and which option you might consider. Now that we are well past that toilet paper shortage, there may be another problem in your bathroom those flushable wipes. They can cause havoc to the sewer system. So now there's something else that is becoming a popular alternative. 12 on your site's Marilyn Moritz says the bidet is having a moment. They might say flushable or septic safe, but any type of wipe can mean problems for sewer and septic systems. They don't break down like toilet paper does, and these videos show what can happen. If you think there's got to be another way, consider the bidet. Bidets are having their moment. The initial cost of a bidet seat might be steep, but... Wipes are certainly cheaper than getting a bidet, but some of the plumbers that we spoke to said that wipes are prone to clogs, even the flushable ones. 
Bidet seats are different from a freestanding bidet. A seat attaches to an existing toilet and uses clean water from your toilet supply line and electricity to produce a stream of warm water. Many come standard with an adjustable nozzle, a heated seat, and adjustable water temperature, all operated by a remote or control panel. If you're reasonably handy, most can be installed DIY. Consumer Reports got personal and asked people for feedback. Bidet seat users liked this Brondel Swash 1000 and gave it top scores for installation and usability. There are also basic seats that don't use electricity, but no electricity means no warm water. Some non-electric seats can attach to your hot water line, so it's a good idea to check. Nonetheless, many happy bidet users gave the Tushy Classic top scores even without the warm water. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Adam Caskey giggling over in the background there. Well, it, it is kind of a funny name. The Tushy Classic. The Tushy Classic. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, <laughs> I, I, yeah, maybe it just talks to how immature Adam and I are. That yeah. Something called the Tushy Classic. I'm, I'm telling you. There's yeah. a giggle. Yeah. <laughs> Lively. If you're are. an eight-year-old boy, you thought that was funny, too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Some older than that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so it, so it's uh, a nice day today. Another nice day. Yeah, a nice bidet. Oh, did you see, see what we did there? Oh, I pulled a spreester. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. No, I had no, to put no you apologies. through that. I had to put you through that. So a few isolated showers out there today. Some rain chances ahead, but don't get your ho hopes up. And then we do have a Friday night cold front to talk about. It's going to be a noticeable one and really... It really put a dent in our temperatures. Let's take a look at the radar right now. East of I-35, basically between I-10 and I-37. That's where we have a little bit of activity over the past couple of hours on the radar screen. You go southward near Victoria, Lavaca County as well. A few pop-up brief downpours. These are at least some heavy showers, but they just don't last for very long. This is a two-hour loop, and you see them pop up rain themselves out, then they're gone and really no lightning associated with them yet. There is a slight chance of a few severe storms in the counties, basically right along the coastline and about one county in as well, but it excludes the vast majority of our viewing area. So south of Hallettsville right now, we've got a little bit of development. These are drifting northward, but not all that much. You go farther to the west, we're looking at I-37 here. So Atascosa County, Wilson, Carnes counties, right where they all come together, a little downpour moving to the northwest, but it has since dissipated. These are having a hard time sustaining themselves. A lot of clouds out there throughout the day today, but not a lot of moisture to show for those clouds. Of course, we could use it. This is the drought monitor, and we've got the extreme drought from about Pipe Creek, Bandera, south through Hondo, down to Catula, and then even B County, Victoria counties, we've got the extreme drought as well. I want to talk about the lake levels. We haven't really touched on these in some time. Medina Lake at only 35% full. That's 37 feet below the conservation pool. Canyon Lakes at 87% capacity. That's six feet below the conservation pool. You look at Choke, it's 33% and that's 23 feet down. And compare them to last year's numbers and we're down all across the board. Here's a look at our rain chances going forward. Still about a 30% chance. So that's tomorrow, Friday, and then even into Saturday. So we could have a few thunderstorms the next couple of days. Saturday, mainly just a few showers. Looking at patterns and trends in the longer term, we're talking about a week and a half to two weeks from now, there is a little bit of hope for a shift in our pattern that could favor rain chances a little bit more. So there is at least a glimmer of hope that we can have. We'll keep you updated. Of course, there's no guarantee on that. 86 out there now, dew point is 67. We're feeling the mugginess. We're up to 90 in Pleasanton, 89 Helotus, 85 New Braunfels, 91 Catula. Temperatures for the most part in the 80s. Tomorrow, 70s because of low clouds, 83 on Friday, Talked about that Friday cold front. Boom, this weekend, we're looking at a little taste of fall. Not yet tomorrow. Tomorrow, 66 in the morning, mid 70s by the afternoon. A few isolated pop up showers or storms possible. Then we get into Friday, 83, still humid to round out the work week. This weekend, though, let's look at Sunday morning. We'll be down in the 40s with high temperatures around 67 and low humidity. Also, pretty gusty on Saturday. Very nice. A little right. touch of winter. A little, well, fall. 
<laughs> True. All right, the Spurs go for the trifecta tonight, Greg. Yeah, and you're going to get it hot. Now's the time to do it right now yeah. because there are only 20 games left in the regular season. They're on the outside looking into the playoff picture at this time. When we come back, we'll get you ready for tonight against Toronto, not in Canada. And it's back to the state title game for the Lee Volunteers coming up. Our San Antonio Spurs wrap up their five-game road trip tonight against Toronto and Tampa, Florida. That's right. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Raptors were forced to find a U.S. city to host them since the Canadian government would not allow the team to travel to and from the United States during the pandemic. But losing the first two games of this road trip, the Spurs were able to snap their overall five-game losing streak by winning back-to-back -back games on the road for the first time since November 2016 against the Mavs in Dallas, most recently against the Magic in Orlando. As a result, they were back at 500 at 26 and 26, but they are still in ninth place in the Western Conference with just 20 games left in the regular season. The season is, is about runs and ups and downs. And, you know, uh, that was, you know, it was a tough part of the season. But, you know, um, like you said, we started in the second Denver game, played well, and um, that poured over to our next two games. And uh, hopefully we can continue with that. All right, tip time is early tonight, 630. Highlights for you tonight on the Night Beat. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Cowboys free agent Alton Smith is set to visit with the Seattle Seahawks despite the fact Dallas head coach Mike McCarthy told us just a few weeks ago that he's not done with Smith. It's according to the NFL Network, the Cowboys took a chance on the veteran pass rusher last year after Smith had been out of football since 2015 due to off-the-field issues, and it paid off after Smith had five sacks and a fumble return for a touchdown. Congratulations go out to the lead volunteers who are headed to the state finals again after holding off Jersey Village last night in Georgetown in the Class 6A state semifinals. Vols strike in the first half off the long pass from Julian Sanchez. Dante Valencia chips it over the keeper and in. It's 1-0 Lee. Same score late in the second half. Vols get some insurance off the header from Jonathan Fascio. Sanchez puts it past the keeper and the Volunteers return to the state title game with a 2-0 victory. That second goal was huge. Big relief for the whole team, really. It really um, put us one goal more, one goal up. And we, get, we got to breathe a little, play more. Um, I'm in the game. I think it's unbelievable for a team to come back to state twice in, in a row. I mean, you don't hear it that much. It's very rare. And for that, I'm proud of my boys. And we got, some, we got Saturday, and let's get the job done. And congratulations to Bernie Greyhounds. They're headed to the Class 4A state championship in soccer after knocking off Huffman Hargrave 2-0. So it sets up the state championship games first. At 6 o'clock on Saturday, it's going to be Lee against Rockwell Heath. But earlier in the day at 10 o'clock at that same field in Georgetown, Bernie will take on Diamond Hill Jarvis. So good luck to both teams for that state title game. There will be a caravan going from San Antonio Absolutely. and Bernie Absolutely. up to Georgetown. Yeah, get out of the way. Yeah. Get out of the way. Thanks, Greg. Get it. We'll be right back. Thanks so much for watching the News at 5 with us. World News up next. We'll see you back here at 6.